Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in today. More and more every day, I'm talking with more financial advisors that are interested in the RIA channel. Compliance flexibility it offers, the superior economics, the different ways that you can add value and deepen the relationship with clients through additional tools and technology. But from my experience, there's still more misconceptions out there about the RIA channel than any other subject that I talk to financial advisors about. Many give me the feedback through our conversations. Corey, I'm not quite ready to make the jump to RIA. I don't feel like I'm big enough. I don't feel like I want to be bogged down with compliance responsibility while also taking care of my clients. And a lot of these misconceptions couldn't be further from the truth. What a lot of financial advisors don't know is that there's a lot of forward thinking entrepreneurial firms out there like private advisor group that have built a model around giving financial advisors all the benefits of an RIA without the actual additional responsibility of running it themselves. A private advisor group is one of the largest and fastest growing RIAs in the industry and really looking forward to discussing with them what differentiates them, what they've actually been seeing in the RIA space recently, and also just talking about some of the questions that you should ask along the way when you're doing your due diligence to make a more, make a more informed decision for your next move. Today on the podcast, we have the CEO of Private Advisor Group, Frank Smith, and the head of sales and solutions, Donald Stahl, on the podcast to talk. How's it going today, guys? It's great. great. Cool. Thanks again for, for, for taking the time to talk. If you guys don't mind, if you could just give us a quick overview of, of, of Private Advisor Group, I think that'd be really beneficial. Sure, Donald, I can I can start and just fill in gaps as uh, as you're used to doing. So um so thank you again Corey just uh great to great to see you great to be on your podcast um and for those that don't know Corey Donald and I uh now at different firms have pretty long history of work together in different capacities for a very long time so uh good to see good to see and talk to a friendly face but um private advisor group has been uh we just celebrated last year our 25 year anniversary um when uh, John Hyland and Pat Sullivan, our co-founders, uh, founded the firm and, and moved to LPL Financial uh, originally as part of that uh, move. And you know, some of you may just a history lesson remember it as Morristown Financial Financial Group out of Morristown, New Jersey. And, and at the time, so you look back at the late '90s, even into the early 2000s, uh, the OSJ model started really ramping up, and that's really what Private Advisor Group started out as. Um, and they, John and Pat, as advisors, recognized the need uh, for local community, recognized the need for a really strong compliance model through uh, OSJ delivery, and uh, really formed a, a pretty pretty interesting community up in Morristown, New Jersey. 2010, so you fast forward a, a decade or a little bit more from there, and that's when and we, we all know when we're part of that the hybrid RA model really became, became uh, in vogue and was a, a massive uh, recruiting success for our profession, was a massive uh, you know, tool to attract advisors, as you point out in the opener, Corey, um, who valued brokerage, but also valued fee-based business or advisory business and, and saw where that direction was going. Um, so they formed an RA back in 2010 and really saw explosive growth uh, at that point. Going a little bit further along on the history lesson, so as an owner-operated firm that you know, back in 2019 uh, was at several hundred advisors, over 600 advisors at the time, uh, we're really faced with a decision. And decisions were were plentiful. It's, you know, what do you do with a firm that's achieved this much scale in, in uh, that period of time? Um, and they decided at that point, among a lot of different options that they were looking at, that they were in a, a really critical spot in our uh, in the life cycle of our business where um, we had achieved scale, uh, the business still valued independence, uh, our, our profession still valued independence, um, and there was a really interesting opportunity when you look at our peer group to, to really invest heavily into private advisor group and equip the firm to be, um, be in business for the next 25 years, uh, which is really our goal. So um, 
John and Pat uh, sought out a, uh, a leader to help them through that transition. In 2020, they brought on uh, R.J. Moore. Uh, many of you know R.J. from uh, his time as president of LPL and CFO of LPL. Uh, you may know him from his uh, time at Cetera, uh, Legal and General, and a couple of other uh, uh, major firms. And, and R.J. knows so much about this business, is incredibly advisor-centric, and helped us uh, through a transition period where, where John and Pat were looking um, at what they wanted to do with the firm. So I was RJ's second hire. Uh, and um, we just, we invested very heavily into the business over that, uh, over the uh, course of 21 and 22, primarily in people, but also in technology and process and, and certain uh, things that we needed to do to uh, evolve the business to be what uh, private advisor group is expected to be in the next 25 years. So as part of that, Corey, uh, we talk about this. I know you talk about it to advisors all the time, having a really thoughtful succession plan. Um, we're really good at talking about that. And we wanted to make sure that we were actively doing that as well as a business. And so we, we purposely went through and thoughtfully went through our own transition as a company over the last couple of years where uh, I was uh, uh, brought in to uh, take over as a, uh, a CEO in January of this year uh, and RJ and Pat um, have moved into executive chairs and John has moved into an executive chair position uh, as we we look to continue to grow the grow the firm on a, a go forward basis. So why that's important is we ask advisors to go through this and it's better to go through this when things are good, right? We have access to the incredible mind and experience of RJ. You've got a lot of the tribal knowledge with Pat and John and others. Um, you have our our thinking coming in and really rounding out uh, rounding out the leadership team and the direction of the firm. Really good position for us to be in from an advisor's point of view, especially the ones you're talking to that are questioning the future of a firm. We've gone through our transition. We're on the other side of that transition, so it's very predictable for them. Um, it shows continuity to the existing advisors who affiliate with private advisor group, um, and and more importantly, it's really created a very sustainable business for us in the future. So as you as you look at it today, uh, 774 advisors as as of today, I think is our count, uh, and uh, you know we're we're continuing to invite more to uh, more to our community. That's awesome. It's been uh, amazing to see your guys' growth. So so congratulations. I mean, what as you were talking about like versus your peers, there, there, there's more RIAs coming into the industry every day that are offering value propositions to basically have an, an, an easy RIA, a soft landing spot into, into the RIA space. What, in your opinion, has made a private advisor group so successful versus its peers? Yeah, I, listen, there's a lot of really good firms out there um, and a lot of them that have very specific business models or very narrow business models. And you have some out there that are very broad and, and everybody in between. Um, of all different shapes and sizes. And so um, advisors have a lot of options. Uh, I know we'll get into the topic of being your own RAA versus partnering with one. Obviously, we're very biased. We think the the, the partnership model makes a lot of sense. We can get into that. Um, but that that has been one of the things that has uh, catapulted our growth is the ability for advisors to not have to run regulated entities, but get all the benefits of uh, being in this space. And, and so we're in a really important spot. We believe we're in a really important spot in our profession where given the relationships we have with um, broker-dealer partners, custodian partners, technology vendors, uh, in, in our scale and all of those relationships and tenure and all those relationships, advisors by partnering through us or with us have the benefits of being with a big firm, but you can do that without the need to either plug directly into that big firm if that's if that community in you know small field is important to you, um, or as we pointed out, formula and regulated entities. So that that's an important spot that we play. I think I mentioned community. That's that's a really big thing for us. We we just had our annual conference. Um, just had it. Just just had it in April. That seems like uh, a little while ago. But um, you know our our annual conference this year. The theme was fostering community, and uh, we we joked we had over you know, 400 people attend this conference in Charlotte. Uh, we joked it was like a family reunion, except we've never had that much fun at a family reunion. And it really is that way where you have so many advisors who are, in essence, as independent advisors. Some of them in the same communities are competitors with each other, but in 
in the private advisor community don't view each other as competitors. They view each other as peers and colleagues, and they want to work with each other and learn from each other. And that's really what we're trying to uh, foster, whether it's community and our relationship with them, their relationship with each other, the relationship we have with sponsors and, and key strategic partners. Um, and, and importantly for us, uh, giving them the, the time back so they can focus on the communities that they operate in. Um, that community, the advisor community, and what, what we believe is differentiating is uh, we're, it's very much, um, we're, our strategy is very much influenced by and informed by their feedback. And that might seem like a very simple thing, but there's a, a lot of mechanisms we have in place from uh, a very uh, diverse advisor council um, that have multiple different uh, or multiple affiliation types that, that help inform our strategy. Um, to uh, the way we conduct surveys and the way we pull that through to uh, really informing uh, our activity and what we invest in on a go forward basis. And there's really tangible ways that, that we can demonstrate that. Multiple ways you can affiliate with us, not to you know, get into every model, but uh, there's, there's a number of ways that advisors can come into private advisor group. Um, we're not going to prescribe to them how to operate their business, very independent. Um, but if they need support, when they need support, um, we're going to provide that to them. And risk management is one of the, the things that just doesn't, you know, of course, it's not the, the operational processes and risk management side of our business from an advisor's point of view doesn't always come across as all that sexy. But if it's something that they're having to manage on their own or build on their own, they recognize how valuable that is uh, to their practice. So that's that's an element that uh, that we bring to them that they don't. Uh, necessarily have to, um, they have to focus on, but they don't necessarily have to build out or manage on their own. And then all that in exchange for really competitive economics. Uh, we we want to make sure that there's a fair exchange in value for price of how advisors work with us. We're not going to fluff things up or or commit to things and, and not meet expectations. We're going to be very transparent around how we work. And that, that um, when we talk about multiple affiliation uh, methods too, Corey, it's also regardless of how advisors enter with custodian relationships. You know, LPL is a, a really big key strategic partner for ours on the custodian side, um, but we have great relationships with others like Schwab and TD and Fidelity and Pershing and interactive brokers and others that advisors value as part of uh, their practice. And we support that as well. So really uh, when advisors come to us, if we can help them solve for that need, we can help them problem solve in some cases. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's you know one of the things that we believe sets us apart. That's great. And I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions out there on the RIA side, but one of the biggest ones that I hear is, is Corey, I don't want to be out there all on my own. I don't want to be on an island. And that's not necessarily the case when you're plugging into a large organization like yours. You have the ability to have the home office staff to be able to help, and you have, you know, a network of financial advisors to lean on. So you're not just out there on an island by yourself. So I definitely like that quite a bit. So, I mean, another question I have, I would imagine you guys are talking with more financial advisors than, than, than most other firms out there, just, just due to your size. What are you guys seeing out there and, and what types of financial advisors are, are, are coming to private advisor group? Yeah, great, great question. So Corey, I would break it down into three key categories of advisors who we are seeing and advisors who then we progress with in conversation. So we, one of the great things about private advisor group is we'll, we'll kind of entertain all conversations. You asked before, what, what makes us special and what has helped us grow? I believe even being one of the newcomers to the team you know, adaptability and creativity has been really, really helpful at Private Advisor Group. And we haven't lost that. We will focus on serving certain communities. But when we get a call, and you know this from our interactions with you, like if you send us someone that maybe has some specific needs, we're, we're going to at least explore it and see if it's something that we can do well. And then one of the things that we commit to those advisors and commit to you is, we'll make an honest assessment. If we can do a good job of it, we'll come back and commit to you as the outside recruiter and to the advisor, yeah, we think we can do this. Or if it doesn't fall in our wheelhouse or we don't think we're gonna do a good job of it, we'll also come back and have that clarity. So I think 
we talk to a lot of scenarios, but where we're seeing the most traction is probably three key groups, succession and liquidity planning. So as much as that topic has been all over the industry, I feel like it's really kind of catching some wind in its sails over the last few years where it used to be a topic and advisor said, yes, I need to name someone. Okay, I'm going to name Frank. And people would ask, well, what's your succession plan? Well, I named Frank and Frank named me. Well, how much is Frank going to pay you? I don't know. Where is he going to get the money from? I'm not sure. But I named Frank. So did, I thought all you wanted me to do was check the box and have someone. Yeah. I think advisors are going to the next stage of saying having someone is, is maybe not enough. They want to know who. They want to know how is it getting funded and they want to know who's their partner to execute on that. So we're seeing a lot of traction there. And I think we'll get into later some solutions that we've come up with that have really helped our existing advisor base. And then now is helping us recruit into private advisor group. The second category that we see a lot of advisors and are doing well is people already operating an RAA or interested in forming one and they want to look at all of their alternatives. And what we're seeing there is a number of people kind of further on in their career, and it kind of generally goes hand in hand with succession planning. They, they're saying, we formed this RAA, we're operating it. Back when we formed it, it didn't take a lot to do. Now I have to have a compliance person. I'm focusing X hours a week on it. I really just want to meet with my clients. And by the way, when I look to exit, I'm not sure who's going to take this over from me. So we're seeing traction there. And we're also seeing traction where, you know, maybe people are meeting with an outside custodian, you know, Fidelity Schwab, and they're saying, I, I want to do this on uh, my own. But then they look at us and say, for a reasonable price, as Frank mentioned, we can really outsource the compliance and operations infrastructure and focus our time. You know, I always say to an advisor, you could probably get one, two, maybe three clients more next year and be way, way ahead in the economic equation versus running your own compliance shop internally. Mm -hmm. And then the third category Frank mentioned as well is advisors are coming around to understanding that if they're going to survive long term, they're going to have to be partnered with one of the major custodians. They're gonna to have to be with LPL Financial, Fidelity, Schwab, or one of the major custodians, but they don't wanna be a number at one of those custodians. And we really fit that middle ground of having access to kind of all the major players in the industry, but you can come to a conference, as Frank mentioned, with 400 of your peers and it be you know, a family, and something you're part of and not something that's kind of too big and too overwhelming. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, back, back to your second bullet, I've been having many, many conversations with, you know, established RIAs that you said, you know, once was easy to handle the compliance piece and in the ever-changing compliance landscape. We just have financial advisors that are tired of doing that on top of serving their clients. And it, there's nothing wrong with having your own RIA whatsoever, but you know, running the numbers versus you know plugging into an existing RIA and outsourcing all of that, you know, the, the numbers are pretty close. And sometimes even plugging in to another RIA could even be more profitable, taking a lot of that additional responsibility off of your back. So it's definitely interesting. Yeah, I I think when you look at the RA marketplace, and and I'll be transparent here. So I've personally been on both sides of this. If I go all the way back to the mid 2000s, I was working at a firm actively starting up. You know, we probably started 25, 30 RAs a year as their broker dealer, and it was the heyday of of you know there was no risk premium to outsourcing. Because you were probably going to get audited maybe once every seven years. A lot of individuals were still state regulated. And if they were state regulated, they were maybe never going to see an auditor. And it, me personally, I was in offices at the time 
that I would ask them for their written procedures manual and they would hand me this thing still in the cellophane wrapper, wrapped, never open. And that was like the way that RAs operated in some fashion back in the mid 2000s. I think now that has changed significantly and you know, not being a, a downer, but the economics are somewhat close until you have your first incident. And I think the moment that you have your first regulatory incident, all of the economics go out the window because you're immediately underwater. If you have any type of fine or issue of magnitude, the delta that you thought that you were making just went out the window. But all of that aside, I, like when I talk to advisors, I try to really take them back to the core of, Corey, when you woke up this morning, did you want to be running an RAA? Do you enjoy what's involved in it? And if you don't enjoy those things or you don't have someone on your team that enjoys those things, why would you take that into your practice and operate it locally when you can outsource it to someone else? Now, I think there are a few caveats, right? If there's something unique in your business that someone like Private Advisor Group or a national level RAA can't get comfortable supporting. You want to run your own strategy with GIPS 10-year audited performance. Maybe you should run your own RAA. But if you just want to operate your practice, have autonomy, be an entrepreneur, and then have someone else doing the oversight, I would say somewhere in the area of 90 some percent of, of opportunities that we even look at we would be able to serve them from an oversight and there's nothing they're doing in, in their business that we couldn't support. Maybe five to 10%, they're doing something unique that wouldn't fit into our business model or we may not be able to get comfortable with. It's, it's really a small amount. And the key thing when working with us is we'll, we'll tell someone that. Like I, if I were meeting with someone or Vern on our team or meeting with someone, we would tell the advisor, hey, that's that's not going to fit well with us. And here's what we think you might want to look at because of your business model. So Don, maybe talk a little bit about where a private advisor group kind of falls into this space. There are certain responsibilities that somebody has when they have to run their own RIA. It's not just compliance. And you know, what are you taking off a financial advisor's back? Yeah, that great question. So it's not just compliance, it's the whole risk kind of umbrella that we're going to insource to private advisor group and have a team of people who's focused on how that regulatory environment is moving forward. So we've got people looking at what regulations are coming. We have people, and Frank will laugh when I say this, we have people thinking about cybersecurity risk and how much of an insurance policy do we need to have to protect everyone? And he'll laugh because every time it comes up, I don't want to hear it because I'm not that guy. Um, I'd rather be out talking about how people do business and how do we get more clients. But I'm very thankful that we have people that are concerned about that and are focused on it. And I think that's my main point is you know, there are anomalies, but the average advisor would normally rather be out talking to their client, not worrying about cybersecurity or passwords or where their data is held. And, and Corey, just to pile on to Donald a little bit, the, some of these things really don't matter if you're a two-person RAA or a 774 advisor RAA. The the lift, the the expense, the investment, the uh, the potential risk or consequence on the other side of not doing that well is largely the same. Um, and so scale scale and experience and tenure absolutely matters and people focused on this full time because um, the barrier to, barrier to entry to become an RAA is still relatively low. And I don't mean that on a, a, a negative basis. It's actually what, what we love about this industry. We're all entrepreneurs and we appreciate that. The consequences though, on the other side of that by not doing it well, or not investing in it appropriately are extraordinarily high. And that's that number and that potential risk is not getting smaller. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I talk with financial advisors all the time that are considering opening up their own RIA. And I ask them to pull up, you know, the broker check of, you know, some of the top independent broker dealers out there. And these firms have, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 home office employees, hundreds of compliance people. And, you know, they have millions of dollars that they're spending on a compliance budget. And they're still, you know, having some oversights. I mean, if those firms are having issues do, doing it, I mean, that should at least, you know, encourage a financial advisor to, you know, look to outsource that. So, you know, the SEC is coming to someone else's door besides their own and shutting down their business for a period of time. So recently, we, we talked about this in the beginning of the podcast, we've been seeing a lot of larger RIAs deciding to, to shut down and roll into a firm like private advisor group. Can you talk about what you're seeing out there in, 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 in the industry and maybe some of the RIAs that have that have come into you? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So um, I, I've had the privilege of working with a few of them over the last year, year and a half. And uh, what's been great is they're all three very unique circumstances, but all trying to solve for gen generally the same thing. And these are uh, long tenured RAAs that for one reason, reason or the other, um, kind of going through a similar, just different scale, but going through a similar question that maybe Pat and John were asking uh, back in 2019 of what's next. And, and what we love about these conversations are, you know, you go back as Donald was pointing out what they wanted to accomplish by forming an RA in the first place. We are fully aligned with that. We, we love that. We're entrepreneurs. We understand the space. We understand the value of the space. But then if they're really being honest with themselves and looking at their time and looking at their resources and what they're getting from that, um, we can solve for much of what they originally set out to do without them having to run or operate or own a regulated entity. In all three of these cases, they were able to uh, shut down their RAA. And that sounds negative or harsh, but it, it wasn't. Um, maintain their local identity, maintain their staff, become part of our larger community, and outsource a lot of the, the functions of the RAA to us in exchange for usually the same or better economics when, when you look at everything holistically, um, certainly lowering the risk pro profile and certainly giving them time back. So um, I think we're, we're talking to more of those. We're going to continue to see more and more of them. Um, and as Donald pointed out, Corey, these are conversations we would love to have on a daily basis because, um, you know, uh, if, if history has been any predictor or there's trends going in that direction, we, we really do think that we can help be a solution for them to help them get what they were looking to uh, originally accomplish, uh, but do so in a way that's uh, more conducive to, to both their business and uh, them as, uh, uh, you know, people, owners of the business. That's fantastic. Oh. I've, I've noticed over the last, you know, five years or so, a lot of RIAs of your size have been, you know, taking on some sort of private equity partner or outside financing to gain a competitive edge versus, versus some of their other competitors out there. You've recently just partnered, partnered with, with Merchant. What does that allow you to do differently or become more competitive against your peers? Yeah, I'll take that. So we um, we started conversations with Merchant uh, in 2021 as part of our um, as part of our evolution, and uh, you know we were investing heavily in the business as we talked about before. Um, we wanted to accelerate some of the um, the elements of our business or business model that we needed to put into market, um, all under the category of of people, process, and technology to make sure that we're providing the right advisor experience both to existing advisors, as well as those that we wanna to continue to invite uh, into private advisor group. And, and to do that, you need capital. Um, to do that, you also need some, some strategic partners who really understand the space on a, a very broad basis and can bring in some of that uh, you know, intellectual capital as well as the actual capital. So uh, we made a decision to uh, partner with Merchant Wealth Partners. Uh, they are a minority non-controlling uh, investor in private advisor group. Um, it's important to, to create a distinction here. They are not a private equity firm. Uh, they are, they are, their business model is minority investments. Um, it's a long-term capital. Uh, they're a long-term partner. 
um, and we're still uh, we're still in control of and, and running the operation on a day to day basis. Now, with that said, we uh, we we got into that partnership with them uh, outside just the capital and credit needs of the business. We got into that partnership with them just given the uh, the the skill and the tenure and the experience of the people that form Merchant Wealth Partners. They come from some of the best RAs in the world, some of the best technology providers, some of the best sponsors or custodians uh, in our business. And they put together a really strong team of, of great minds that are really well-rounded, um, both in the history of our space, but also where the where the space is going. Um, so that was important to us. So again, uh, we, we were not um, interested in a traditional private equity sponsor. We wanted something that was uh, more long-term because we are a long-term focused firm. But they do bring with it some really interesting things uh, as we look at um, practice acquisitions or helping advisors with succession. Um, as we look at the credit and capital needs, not just for private advisory group as a business, but underlying advisors who are affiliated with private advisory group, there's, there's help that they provide as well. Um, and also deal mechanics. They're, they're working on uh, a lot of interesting things external, and we are able to tap into that knowledge and, and also think through things like technology or other types of product or different types of structure and how we approach the business. So uh, that's been that's been a good move for us, good partners. And, um, you know, again, Corey, we just, uh, you know, it was important to, it was important our evolution, but still very important to say that, uh, you know, what, important to say what they are, but also very important to say what they're not. And, and uh, that's why we're trying to make that um, private equity versus long-term money distinction. And all of this additional, you know, dollars in the RIA space has been so beneficial. I remember when I first started recruiting in the independent channel, and you're talking about building enterprise value in your business and succession planning and being able to sell your practice. And pretty much the only solution then was just selling to another person down the road in Greensboro, North Carolina. And that, that was pretty much it. You had to shop inside of your marketplace. And now there's just so many more different ways to be able to monetize your practice. And I, I, I've noticed the RIA industry in general, and also private advisor groups really gotten into the M&A space quite a bit over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and this is also a space that I think advisors have a lot of misconceptions. I, mean, I, I think a lot of advisors feel that the only way that they could sell their practice is if they sell 100% of their business incorporate the clients to the seller for a couple of years, and then they're off and fully retired. And that very much couldn't be the case. That's definitely one way to do it. Um, but there's a lot of other options out there for a financial advisor to you know, partially monetize their, their life's work and still be on and still be the CEO of their, of their organization. And I'm just curious what you've been seeing out there and you know, how you can help financial advisors monetize. Yeah, great, great question, Corey. I'll take that one. Um, I'll touch on three key themes or three key platforms that we've created over the last 12 to 18 months. I think one of the things to highlight here we talked about before, which is in private advisor groups DNA to really be problem solvers, but in being problem solvers to also make sure that we're creating a sustainable platform. So the reason I mention that is, as opportunities have come to us over the last 12 to 18 months, we don't look at them just on a one-off basis. We look at it to understand the advisor need. But then, you know, I don't want to speak for Frank, but we've both worked with a lot of the same people. We've had really great mentors that have trained us in, you know, identify an opportunity, but then identify, is there a market trend that's going to continue? that there's two, three, four, 12 more individuals just like the person you're speaking to. And so what we've done over the, that time is say, hey, these scenarios really look like this, but let's not make it a one-off experience. Let's build a platform around that advisor need that we could go do a number of more times. And one of the key things that we've done there and that I really enjoyed working with a number of these advisors as we sat down with them and asked them, what are you seeing in the marketplace? What are the offers that you have in front of you? A big thing that I always want to know is, what do you love about it? And what scares you? And let's do all the things that you love if we can, 
and let's figure out how to eliminate or minimize the things that scare you. And so that enabled us to come up with some pretty neat platforms that if you looked at them on the surface, you know, one of them, probably the, the maybe the, the least complex is a sell and stay model where an advisor could sell their book to private advisor group or some collective and then continue to manage the same clients and continue to work with them. Not, not uh, a novel idea in the industry, but what we did that is quite different is we found ways that the advisor typically is not gonna take the private advisor group brand. They're gonna stay under their own brand. They're gonna manage their own staff locally. They're not really going to change how they're doing business today, other than that they've monetized the business and they have a long term strategy with us. But they're going to continue to be stall wealth management and make their decisions locally. We're not going to influence them based on our beliefs or one unified way of doing business. That I believe is pretty unique in the industry. And now it doesn't mean that we're going to partner with just anyone or say, hey, Corey, whatever you want to do, go for it. Good luck. We're, we're now the owner, ultimately, of that book of business. So we're going to have some ring fencing to make sure that it's on a good trajectory. But we're not going to come in and change everything that the advisor's done up to that point that typically made them successful. Um, one of the other things that we did, it's pretty unique, is we identified a spot in the market where even if someone found an advisor locally or they bought, brought a next generation advisor into their practice, some of these practices are larger than that successor advisor could go out and get lending to facilitate the transaction. And so we found a number of advisors, especially in the last 12 months, where I think the one advisor I worked with he was eight or 10 years deep into working with his senior partner. I don't know what to call them anymore. Senior advisors, junior advisors, Gen 2. None of the terminology makes sense, but the Gen 2 advisor had been with the senior for eight to 10 years, but he wasn't going to be able to come up with 100% of the money up front to buy the practice from any known lender. And now the, the senior advisor received an offer that he didn't have to wait five or 10 years for the normal payout schedule to happen. He could take one lump sum, de-risk, not worry about whether the practice um, decreases over time. And that junior that was eight to 10 years into the practice almost was gonna be an employee of another firm overnight. And I asked that advisor, hey, th is this ever, ever why you started this journey eight years ago? to be someone else's employee working this group of clients. And he said, no, I never, I probably never would have started this journey. Yeah. And so we came up with a package where we could co-invest with the advisor and buy the practice together. And in that certain situation, going back to your merchant question, we were able to partner with merchant and put together a package where we could go help that advisor get capital and, and do the deal and retain ownership in what they had invested in for many, many years. Um, and the cool thing there, again, as soon as we found one, we had two other practices right behind it where we did the same thing in, in rapid succession. Right after we did the first one, we did two more right afterwards. Um, the third, uh, is something I think that people are hearing a lot about and we're doing it in a unique way, which is really a minority stake or a partial deleveraging where someone says, I like the idea of ultimately knowing that I have a succession pathway, but I'm not done yet. I'm four years out, seven years out. I have a certain time frame, but I don't have a solid succession plan in place. And I realized that a private advisor group or a large firm like private advisor group may get a different multiple in the marketplace during an, a liquidity event than I would at you know, a 
$2.3 million a year in annual revenue practice, my multiple might be very different than someone else's. And so we've created a platform where an advisor can deleverage and, and we take a minority stake up front and then they can piggyback on a future liquidity event with us. Again, pretty unique there, all optional on their part, whether they join that program or not, optional whether they participate in the future and with no meaningful changes to really how they do business today. Again, they're not changing brand, they're not becoming a private advisor group advisor. They're just joining a group of other like-minded advisors who we've created a pathway going forward. So those are kind of the big three that we've seen, the full sell and stay, the helping a second generation advisor, and then the deleveraging through a minority stake with a future opportunity to sell. Hey, Corey, can I add to that that third point a little bit? Is that, okay, so I, I um, and thanks, Donald, for that that commercial there. I think it's you said a couple things that if I'm if I'm one of your listeners and I'm contemplating a move to a firm and I I, I start perking up because I'm hearing things like equity programs or um, you know liquidation and monetization and things like that. Um, especially that that could potentially uh, be heard as in conflict with the message at the beginning of we want to be in this business for the next 25 years plus plus plus. Um, and I, I think it's important to for people to understand that um, advisors can seek liquidity, advisors can seek monetization uh, and, and not be disruptive to their clients or to their business, as Donald's pointing out. And that's no different for at the firm level for a firm like private advisor group, where it's just very natural as part of our life cycle to at some point in that life cycle, uh, you know, see some level of monetization in our business, right? Especially as a, a privately held business, uh, that's that's going to be an important part of uh, our future. But what we've committed to uh, is we're going to do that in a way that's not disruptive to us, not disruptive to advisors, not disruptive to investors. There's just no no reason or point in doing that, not part of our strategy. And, and the way that we we accomplish that is just by putting some check and balance in place, but also some pretty significant recognition, recognition that um, advisors as part of this program, they may be asking like, what, what's, what's the catch? It's it's simple. We're we're recognizing that advisors are the primary contributors of the value of our firm, and and without those relationships, without their desire to grow and be entrepreneurial and to partner with us in that journey, um, private advisor group is is you know it, it's not worth anything. But we're we're a highly valued firm, uh, a very diverse firm in terms of how our revenue is made up from 774 uh, individual entrepreneurs and contributors. As Donald points out, the marketplace puts a premium on that and puts a premium on that in, in a way that is significantly or, or multiples higher than an individual advisor practice. And so through this program, I think terms we've used like tag along rights to any sort of monetization we do in the future is important um, because going back to what it is and what it isn't, uh, what it's not is it's not a drag along right. And, and getting into the check and balance or, you know, I guess a drag along wouldn't necessarily be a right. A drag along is a drag along by definition. It's, it's something you're forced to do. And getting, getting back into the, uh, the check and balance conversation, any sort of future monetization as part of our life cycle is going to be done in a way where advisors don't have to go through custodian changes or broker dealer changes or uh, name changes, right? It's, it's you're able to create value without having to do those things. And by doing it on a tag along basis, advisors have the ability to opt in at the level that they want to opt in under the, uh, the, the rules or the objectives of the program. And if we're presented with or we present an option to the group of advisors that are part of this program that is disruptive or is not conducive to how they want to uh, see value in their business now and in the future, they don't participate and the value of that opportunity goes to zero. So that's that's how we've we've both in recognition and now in how we've structured this equity program uh, puts the advisor really in the driver's seat where everything we do is is central to uh, their success and in the future of their their practices and certainly the certainly the legacy of what they've uh, what they've accomplished. So 
we've seen a just a, a little bit more of a commercial plug for that. Um, we'd love to talk to any advisors who are interested in that uh, because we do think it solves for a lot of things. But one of the things that's been most exciting from the conversations that we've had with advisors who have participated so far, and, and we've we've been blown away by the reaction uh, to this program, is just the the mindset shift that happens on some occasions where you're going from a from what we we don't want to have just a vendor client relationship with advisors, and we understand that's just part of the nature of our business, and, and that's okay. Um, we want to have a a relationship with advisors when we're, we're both very interested, certainly in each other's success, but this one moves into a category of now we're both very much invested in each other's success, and you extend that now to the peer group of advisors that are participating in this, and now we've got this this really large collective that's all aligned and oriented towards growth and in, in maximizing value and not in a lean way, but in a very opportunistic way. And that's been a lot of fun for us to have conversations with advisors that are very entrepreneurial around, all right, well, who, who else can we invite into this? And what are other mechanisms of growth? And how does this then help us plan for, I'll use Donald's terminology, plan for gen two, uh, when, when ultimately this is a retirement event for me as an advisor, not me, but if I'm talking as an advisor and I, I still want the legacy of my practice to continue, let's start having those conversations and making those investments now. So we're solving for a lot of things, liquidity, succession, bringing Chen to in this business and, and aligning our interests in a way where we're protecting this for, uh, protecting private advisory group and what we show up for every day for generations. And, you know, if you, you hear a little bit of passion or excitement and how we talk about that, it's because it's um, it, it's a it's an incredible program and one that we think we're in a really unique position along with advisors to uh, to take full advantage of. And I, and I do want to give one plug. This is uh, I, I failed to mention it a little bit earlier. This is one of the benefits of the relationship we have with Merchant, uh, who has been both a capital and credit partner uh, with us in this, but also um, helped us in the design and execution. And, and that's a to do this well, and for this not to be fluff or to be smoke and mirrors, which it certainly is not. It's a very structured, uh, very documented, uh, very legal program. Um, you need you need good partners that are showing up in a meaningful way, and we've been we've been really pleased pleased with the results so far. Love to talk yeah, to I you mean, about it. Thank you. I mean, I, and I've I've seen a lot of financial advisors just have such positive feedback on a program like this. I mean, a financial advisor, if they're helping rise, you know, the larger RIAs tied, you know, they should, they should get compensated for that. And the fact that they are, I mean, really makes them feel really, really good about, about, about the firm that they're going to align with. And that goes really well with, with my next question. I mean, as you, as you both know, there are a ton of RIAs out there offering equity as an attractor for top talent. As I'm, as I'm consulting financial advisors, I try to tell them that all equity is not created equal. The equity given by a $400 million slow growing RIA is going to turn out completely different than the equity given by a 20, 30, $40 billion RIA that's growing you know, very, very quickly. If you were a financial advisor that was getting, you know, offered different equity deals when considering a move, what were some of the questions that that, that you think you would ask to decipher yeah. the differences? If, if I can, Frank, let me start this one out. And, yep. and I'm glad you queued that one up, Corey, because it's all I was thinking about in that last segment while Frank was speaking, is I think one of the key important items for advisors to consider is that level of transparency on ultimately what is the RAA or the partner's long-term vision and how are they working towards it? So if, if you think about this, it all works in concert. Very often we're speaking with and working with the advisor on their succession plan. It would be very reasonable and rational for us to then talk about our internal succession plan and our leadership. And when I meet with a, a potential advisor of ours, I always highlight, you know, you're looking at Frank Smith. He's the long-term CEO uh, before any liquidity events, after any liquidity events. And you're looking at the team that's running the firm. 
I don't know when you meet with other firms that you're seeing the same people that are going to be with you long term. And for me, I know when I speak to advisors, you know, even when they see a super large number for their valuation and they get all excited, after that excitement fades, they still want to know who's going to be serving their clients long term. Because just as you and Frank mentioned, it's those clients that built their legacy and that they're going to be monetizing. And most advisors don't feel comfortable monetizing that in a way that would leave their clients ultimately not well served. So I think once the valuation halo fades, knowing the predictability and that somebody has a plan and where it's going. And also I'd highlight what Frank mentioned the kind of rigor in our different programs and how they're formed and the entities that we utilize. Like we'll be transparent about all of those and take an advisor through every gory step. Um, Corey, you know, working with me, one of the most painful things is I'll probably share way more than you ever want to consume, but there'll be nothing left to the imagination on what might happen or how does this work uh, if an advisor walks away and they didn't understand it, it's because they tuned out two thirds of the way through my explanation. It's not because they didn't have the opportunity to learn exactly how what works, what they're about to get into. Yeah, I um, could not agree more with that, Donald, having been on the other side of a lot of your explanations. So, um <laughs> Uh, no, so I, I think that that's great. That's great setup. I think a, a few big picture questions I would ask if I'm an advisor and in, in is part of that conversation. Um, one would be just the why, like what's the motive? What's not necessarily the advisor motive. Of course, advisors want uh, equity if that's an option for them. But what's the what's the motive of the firm offering that to advisors? And why would they let the advisor participate? Um, I think that's it needs to be more than a PowerPoint presentation. You really have to get into the, uh, to the understanding of that. Um, uh, so structure is obviously an important one. So how, how is your equity actually structured? What type of entity Donald pointed out? We have a lot of different entities that have to be formed to maintain uh, the, right, uh, the right level of transparency and, and mechanics around how this works. And uh, as an equity participant, you see all of that. You're able to do, uh, you know, ha have you and your attorney uh, do the full due diligence on that to make sure that there's legitimacy there. If it's just on a PowerPoint slide or if it's a wink and a nod, um, that's something that I would make sure that you you peel back even more. And there's a lot of, and, and really not trying to be critical, we just, in, in our business, we see a lot of these out there and some are more verbal handshake type things, not saying they're necessarily bad or good, but that's, that, that is something you have to understand all the way through something that's very, uh, very detail oriented and documented, which is where our sits. Um, and I just, I would want to know that the, the other part of that is just, uh, how are they, how, do, how does the math work and what are they basing valuations off of? There's so much data out there. Corey, you see it every day. We see it every day. Um, but really want to understand, um, get into the CFO mind of what's the capital structure of the organization? Has the organization already been marked to market formally? That's actually one of the benefits of our, our sponsor uh, with, with Merchant is we went through a structure where our firm was valued. And continues to be, and so that's that's part of the valuation. That's a part of our valuation process, which uh, lends credibility to the program. And then the final thing is, and this is again big picture, but what's their strategy? And and this is an important one. How does the advisor benefit? Why is it a benefit to the firm? What does the future look like? Is this some open ended thing that really doesn't have an end in mind, um, or is it a relatively short? timeline where the advisor is not necessarily aligned with the ability to grow and maximize value as part of that. Um, and then some of the what what happens after the fact. There's a lot of different nuances that we've we've learned through this process based on the advisor's own time cycle. Their their practice life cycle or time cycle may not match up perfectly to ours. And that's okay, but it's important to understand what our strategy is so the advisor can choose whether or not to do that. 
And, and what I love about this, and, and this is kind of a, a, a 1B to some of this, ours is, as Donald pointed out, ours is 100% voluntary. Out of 774 advisors, we don't expect uh, every single one of them to participate in this program or every single advisor that wants to join private advisor group in the future to participate in the program. And that's okay. The program still works without that. Um, we still love those advisors and want them to be part of the community and want to uh, create a great experience for them, regardless as to whether or not they participate in that. That kind of gets into the motive component of it, but also gets into the strategy. What's what's the end game for that program? Is it full participation or bust? Or is this something that is truly additive to advisors that see value into it, in it? Unfortunately, ours is the latter, and we're committed to that. Awesome. Well, as you said in the very beginning of the podcast, I mean, it's clear you're listening to your financial advisors, the the community, the the flexibility that you're providing on your platform and with the new partnership program. It's very easy to see why you guys are successful and will continue to be. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what's next. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Corey. Thanks. Thank Corey. you so much for the time, guys.